God made the heavens and the earth. I think that's Italy. <laughs> you know, I'm not a cartographer. But that's Florida. Yeah, it's not half bad, is it? No, mm -hmm. not too bad. There's Mexico, Central America. <laughs> that's not too terrible, and there's England and Ireland. And there's a big island out there somewhere. <laughs> Good job. Greenland is not green, but Iceland, it is ice. Uh, there's Iceland. Greenland's bigger, right? Um, if you read Genesis chapter 1 very carefully, since some of you have heard me talk about this before, um, so my apologies, but some of you are going to hear this, I think, for the first time from me. Uh, in Genesis chapter 1, it says that God created the heavens and the earth. Uh, and he makes the land, the sea, animals, and all that kind of stuff, right? Everything that exists is made by God. Beginning, you remember last week, we talked about bara, which means to create something fundamentally different from what was before, right? Before this, what's there? Nothing. Nothing. Then God baras creates something. Um, now, in Genesis 1-1, he talks about separating the land from the waters, but there's this fascinating verse that says that God created an expanse the expanse is called sky, and then it says God separated the water above the expanse from the water below the expanse. And people have always wondered, what does it mean, the water above the expanse? What I'm going to share with you right now is something I read from a man named Henry Morris. Henry Morris has a doctorate in hydraulics. So he's not just a pastor saying, hey, I'm going to come up with some crazy stuff. This is a man with a doctorate in hydraulics, and he says that his view is that the entire world was surrounded by a thick water vapor. Not the clouds of the sky, but a thick water vapor that surrounded the entire world. That's what the water's above the sky and the water's below the sky. And then what he says is, when the sun would shine onto this water vapor, what would it do? It created the entire earth was like a greenhouse, right? Sun hits water, warms up. So he says the entire earth was a greenhouse and everything grew everywhere. It wasn't cold at the poles and warm in the equator. The entire earth was warm across the entire earth. When you think of ancient plant fossils, what do they look like? They're huge, right? That's what he's saying. The earth is a greenhouse. The sun was shining onto this and that creates, first of all, the long, the long lives of the same before. Uh, the flood, but creates the large animals and the large plant life and a warm earth everywhere. Now, this is what it looked like for we know not how long, except for this. We just read it on Noah and the Ark. Now, bear in mind, again, the purpose of this sermon series is to say, when you were a child, we talked about Noah and the Ark, and we had a cute little picture of giraffe's head sticking up out of the Ark. That's nothing wrong with talking about that like that with kids, but we're adults, so we want to say, what on earth was going on here? And I know what many adults do is they say, let's act as if it never happened, right? We'll talk about it with the kids, we'll buy a cute little Noah's Ark display for the kids' room, but then after that we'll pretend that it never happened again. I don't think that's the right answer. I think the answer is to ask what happened. Now Genesis 6 says that the entire world was corrupt. By the way, we think we live in tough times, don't we? The Bible says that in Genesis 6, it's probably worse than it's ever been. The inclination of man's heart was only evil all the time, that's what we thought about, with only a handful of people. The entire world was full of corruption and violence, and God says, I'm going to wipe away this world. Now, what does he do? It says that the water sprang up from the deep. That's very hard to get what that means. Of course, we do know now there is water under the ground, but this is what uh, Henry Morse says, is that God precipitated this onto the earth. That water vapor falling, how, how much water was out there? Oh, wow. Enough to cover the entire globe. Now this is what he says. By precipitating that onto the earth, it drowns everything, with the Bible keeps saying everything has you know, breath in its nostrils. What's that mean? Breathing animals. If you're living on the face of the earth and you're breathing air, everything perished except for Noah and his family and the ark. Now what happens then is that the water vapor, once you precipitate it, is what? It's gone. That's no longer there. And that creates the world that you and I live in. What has happened in our world? 
without the greenhouse effect, now it is cold at the ends and hot in the middle. It's hotter in South Carolina than it is in Connecticut. I mentioned those are two states I've lived in. It snowed in Connecticut yesterday. The kids had a snow day from school, but I was wearing a short sleeve shirt in 79 degree weather, right? That's not that far apart. Why, by the way, why do people live in the north? That's what I'm going to But anyway, that's, that's not a biblical text. Um, let's, let's get. Um, I want us to hear a couple things. The Bible tells us that God told Noah how to make the ark, and it gave the dimensions. But it says it in cubits. So it says it's 300 cubits long. The cubit is a foot and a half. So in modern terms, if it's 300 cubits, how long is the ark? 450 feet. And then it actually tells us the height and the width. I'm not going to worry about that right now. Um, it's, I think it's 50 cubits wide and 30 high, right? So it's 75 feet wide. So here's the thing you want to know. If you, and, and God tells them to make three decks, 450 feet times 75 feet times three decks is over 100,000 square foot of room. Now the Bible says regularly the word kinds. You've heard that before in Genesis 1 and Genesis 6 and 7 and 8. It's talking about animals according to their kinds. According to their kinds, living things according to their kinds, uh, the birds of the air according to their kinds. What does the word kinds mean? It doesn't mean species, right? It means some category. This is what we some of us feel. So there's not enough room on the ark. Uh, Noah didn't bring all the dogs. What did he bring? Two dogs. Some dogs. Since the flood, there's been diversification, of course. But we want to get this. A 450 feet long, 75 feet wide, shipbuilders say those are wonderful dimensions for stability. What kind of water was it going to be on? Yeah. Rough water. Rough water. For how long? About a year. Right? About a year. Uh, so that's a long time, and God made provision for them, and God uh, watched over them and granted them safety, but eventually caused this water to subside. I want us to get something about it. Uh, where they went, we don't know. Has the Ark of Noah ever been found? No. No. There's a lot of people that have websites that say they have or haven't or whatever. Um, we don't know. By the way, what was the Ark made out of? Wood. How long does wood last? Well, it's actually pretty good, but not forever. Here's a question for us. When did all this happen? When did this happen? Long time ago, says <laughs> this lady in the front of the church. I married her, by the way. But anyway, so, so she's right, of course. But here's what I want to say. Um, how destructive is water? Very. When a city is flooded, how destructive is water? Right. Very. This is my view. People can argue, people have different views. You're allowed to have different views on stuff like this, but this is my view. Because of the destructive power of water, everything that you and I call recorded history, you hear my phrasing? Recorded history. I'm not talking about art, I'm not, I'm not talking about you know, paleontology. I'm about, when we say recorded history, stuff that people wrote down, these are things happening in my lifetime. I believe that everything that we call recorded history is on this side of the flood. Because what happened to the world of the flood? It's gone. With one caveat. You know what really happened to the world before the flood? It's fossilized. Right? Mm. How, do you make a, how do you make fossils? Something dies in mud and water flows through it. How many fossils are there on the face of the earth? A lot. Guess where they come from? I think the flood. The flood has created the fossils. And you and I have lived in a world post-flood. So that means that every civilization, again, I would say that somebody wrote about it, the Egyptians, what's that? Post-flood? Sumerians? Post-flood? In this valley civilization? Post-flood. The pyramids? I believe, people argue about this, but the pyramids, in my view, post-flood. So Egyptians, um, the Incan Empire, all these things, they're all post-flood. Now, um, I wanted to get something that happens with this. Of course, the sun is still shining. We live in a different world. It's cold here. It's warm there. Um, when, I don't know exactly, but 
this is what we're going to say. It's pre-recorded history. Right? How long do those civilizations go back? If you go back to Samaria or to, to Heth or stuff like that, you wind up to Egypt. They only ever get back until my contemporary writing. Five, six thousand BC, something like that. Right? All of that. Okay. God, I'm going to just get a couple things. God protects Noah. Right? These were dangerous times, they were perilous times. God protected Noah. Do we live in dangerous and perilous times? Yeah. Yes. And we pray for God to protect us. They went through the flood and God protected. We read a bunch of Bible verses. We didn't quite get, we read 6, 7, and 8 in Genesis. Genesis chapter 9, God says, he's already said in chapter 8, I read that, I'll never destroy the earth by flood again, right? Here's one reason, the water vapor's gone, right? I, and I know God is God, he can do anything he wants, but it is the case that with the water vapor and precipitating on the earth, he, he got to do that one time, right? And so the water vapor is now on this earth, actually at our poles, right? That's where it is. Um, but there's this one wonderful thing. Uh, God says, I'm going to make a covenant with you. Did you know the first time the word covenant ever happens in the Bible? You already heard in Genesis chapter 6. At the beginning of the flood era, God says, I'm going to make a covenant with you to go into the ark and protect you and watch over you. But at the end of this, God says, I'm going to make a covenant with you and the whole creation. I'll never destroy it. And in this wonderful phrase, Here's the sign of the covenant. Right? Covenant means an agreement between us and God. God makes those covenants, not us. God initiates the covenant. I'm making a covenant with you. It's a promise. He never breaks his promises. And then sometimes he says, just here's the covenant. But sometimes he says, I'm making a covenant, and here's the sign of the covenant. This one has a sign. What is the sign? Rainbow. 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 Here's a fun factoid that we get from Dr. Henry Morris, Morris, doctor of hydraulics. He says with the water vapor system, no rainbow. rainbows have never appeared. When do they start appearing? In this world. So this is it. So again, we've turned it into a children's story. I want us to get this. Next time you see a rainbow, you know what I want you to think? I want you to think, it used to be this, and now it's this, right? When you see the rainbow, God wasn't kidding. I put the rainbow in the sky. You live in conditions now where rainbows happen, and you live in conditions where rainbows happen because God precipitated water vapor onto the earth, and God has promised to never do it again, which, of course, physically makes sense, right? The sign of the covenant. Fascinating verse in Genesis chapter 9. In Genesis chapter 9, um, this is a surprising passage. When we think of the sign of the covenant, who should look at it and think of it? We do, but you know who else does? God does. Genesis 9, 15, and 9, 14. When I bring clouds over the earth, and the bow is seen in the clouds, I will remember my covenant that is between me and you. Did you know that's what the text says? Who remembers? Isn't that surprising? We would think, I should look at that and I will remember the covenant. What does God say? I will see the rainbow and, and who remembers? God remembers. It's really funny to think about that, right? Now think about this. When the Lord Jesus celebrated the supper with his disciples, he says, do this in remembrance of me. And we think, I'm supposed to remember the Lord Jesus. And you should, but you know what else he's saying? When we celebrate communion, you know who else remembers the covenant? God does. God sees his people gather around word and sacraments as I have made promises to keep and protect my people and to love them according to my grace. And they gather around word and sacrament. It's not that God forbids. God remembers means that God will act in your favor. So, Genesis 9, 15. I will remember my covenant. I believe this is history. It happened in time. 8,000 years ago, 7,000 years ago. But next time you see a rainbow, 
you should remember, but know that God remembers his covenant. And next time you have the Lord's Supper, know that the Lord Jesus is your Savior for your grace and forgiveness. And at the same time, God is saying, those are my people, I remember them. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Who does the remembering? God. God does. Amen. 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 Amen.